afternoon, everyone. Um, on behalf of the five of us, I just want to thank you all for the opportunity to present to you. Um, as you know, uh, this is our practicum presentation. So over the past eight weeks, we've been working on this culminating project for our senior, uh, our senior year and the public policy program. Um, we'll all be graduating. Um, Tubbs, Daniel, sorry, will be uh, <laughs> returning next year as a co-term. Um, so very quickly before we get started, I want to introduce ourselves. Uh, my name is Hunter Kadama. Uh, this is Daniel Tublin, Chris Baldock, Mary Bass, and Hannah Kaufman, uh, and this has been the team uh, working this quarter. Um, so, jumping right into it. <coughs> First, a little note about our clients. Um, and I say clients with an S, because um, we had a very unique opportunity this year, uh, this quarter, to work with actually two clients who are collaborating on an issue. Um, so the clients were the City of San Jose and the County of Santa Clara. Um, specifically, we've been working with the Director of Housing, uh, as well as the County uh, the Director of Housing for Santa Clara, uh, as well as the Chief Operating Officer for the County Offices of, of Santa, Santa Clara. Um, it's, it's a very unique situation because, as Russ noted a few times throughout the quarter, uh, the two don't often, don't, not, not often, don't always get along and often have conflict between them. Um, and we've, we've found in some of our other case studies that there's been similar conflict in other regions about who's responsible for homelessness in the city or the county. Um, and so they have both recognized homelessness to be a very serious issue um, and therefore brought us together to work with them uh, and for them to decide how best to approach the issue and to move forward. So our <laughs> there's supposed to be an image here that was working when we practiced, but it's not right now. Um, anywho, uh, the, the, the one thing that we noticed when we started this project, there's kind of uh, two different Silicon Valleys, um, and one of them often goes unnoticed. So you think of Silicon Valley, and you think of uh, the, the, the tech industry, you think of lots of uh, you know, big business, high paying jobs. Um, statistically speaking, um, in San Jose, the city itself, uh, the median house price is over $600,000. Um, if you expand that to Silicon Valley as a region, you know that it's the you know it's the area with the most uh, the highest paying uh, highest income earners in the, in the nation, um, highest concentration of millionaires and billionaires in the nation. Um, the average uh, the, the median home price in Silicon Valley is over eight hundred thousand um, dollars, but at the same time we see in uh, many areas in San Jose specifically uh, a, a different problem, a completely different situation. So this is the other side of Silicon Valley. So homelessness is a very prevalent issue in the area. There are over 7,600 homeless individuals, and it's growing at a rate of 20% in the past three years in San Jose and 8% in Santa Clara County. Another disheartening statistic is that 80% of those individuals who are homeless were originally in the area. Now this means that those people were not migrating in because of the warm climate, it means that they were kicked out of their house due to high housing costs or unemployment. Um, there have been highly publicized deaths over the past couple of months, in the, in the, especially in the winter. Um, and this image right here is known as the jungle, which is a backwoods of an area next to San Jose, and it houses about 300 people. And it's the largest encampment of homeless in the United States. So why does this issue matter? Why is San Jose, why does homelessness matter to San Jose? Well, first of all, it's a detrimental effect on the economy. Homelessness reduces property values because it's unsightly. And secondly, it's also an issue of public safety and diverts enforcement uh, resources to other things that need to be looked at. And especially with San Jose, there's a contamination of the waterways and there's um, very significant pollution next to the encampments of these people. And then also it hurts economic development. It's very hard to predict where these certain people are going to move to next, and therefore businesses are less likely to develop. So overall, it's inefficient. A temporary solution is not as efficient as a permanent solution. Stability in a home does, is better than reoccurring emergency visits. And the permanent, the permanent solutions are ones we need to look at now. But most of all, this is a moral question. Can we live in a society that is as wealthy as we are right now, where we have individuals like living in the jungle? Can, we need to be able to do something about this. So, our client is overwhelmed. Uh, they don't know what to do with the, to how to, they don't know how to address homelessness. 
They know it if you address it if you address it in one area, then it moves to another. Therefore, they are poised to work together, like Hunter said, and address homelessness on a regional scale. So our client has come to us and asked us two questions. First, what can San Jose and Santa Clara learn from other regions addressing homelessness? And secondly, more specifically, how have other regions organized across the dotted lines and across jurisdictions? And here's Chris. Thanks. Um, so I'm now going to take you all through how we actually went about studying this issue. Um, so we decided with the client uh, that a case study approach would be the most effective uh, for this particular information. And so what we did originally was we picked about 15 uh, metropolitan regions uh, with some client input and then also with our own additional knowledge and research. And we um, studied them on a variety of metrics. So um, first, of, but before we did that, of course, we had to understand what some of the distinguishing characteristics of Silicon Valley actually are so we could find the appropriate uh, um, analogs. So some things we identified, first of all, housing. As has already been mentioned, uh, this is an extremely a uh, high-priced area, uh, one of the most expensive metropolitan areas in the nation. Uh, what we haven't touched on yet is the fact there's also uh, very low supply. So across all uh, price ranges, there is very little rental or um, at very little housing supply for both rentals and uh, sale. And this is especially prevalent at the low uh, at the lower levels of pricing. Uh, a second distinguishing aspect we wanted to uh, keep in mind was the fact that Silicon Valley's homeless population is growing. Furthermore, it's a highly unsheltered population. Almost 75% of all homeless in Silicon Valley do not have access to shelter, and by that I mean they don't have access to emergency shelters or to transitional housing or to permanent supportive housing. And that's extremely high, much higher than most other areas in the country. Um, it's also, sorry, I forgot to mention, there's also a significant subpopulation of veterans. And, uh, you see other, that was something we wanted to keep in mind because other areas that have struggled with the veteran population um, or have a large veteran population might be better analogs uh, when we're actually studying the issue. And a, a final point I'd like to bring up is the political structure uh, in this region. Silicon Valley actually make, or is made up of four counties. Uh, it's a very fragmented structure. There's no dominant player in the region for this issue. Um, and that's particularly important because homelessness is an issue without boundaries. There, homeless uh, individuals can move across uh, town lines, across county lines. Um, and so without a comprehensive regional approach, it's very hard to uh, effectively address it. Furthermore, uh, Santa Clara County in particular has the interesting characteristic whereby San Jose makes up more than half the county. It's a city of over a million people. Um, it's the 10th largest city in the U.S., in fact. Um, but it's surrounded by many other smaller cities. And so this makes for a very interesting power structure in terms of resources, in terms of political will, um, and creates a lot of the tensions that we currently see. So what this all means, of course, is that we need to find the regions that best uh, fit uh, Silicon, Silicon Valley's uh, distinction characteristics. So we created this big matrix, essentially, to try and make sense of all of this. And this is just a, a snapshot of part of it. And what I want to draw attention to is not the specific figures here, but just that we had sort of an analytical approach here. And we tried to really break it down and highlight some of the most important factors. As you can see, uh, median house price is one of those. Um, whether they actually had a committee that was dedicated to homelessness. These were a couple of the things that we wanted to keep in mind as we tried to find the best fits. And so after doing this for 15 regions, uh, we ended up settling on five different regions for case studies. Those are New York, uh, Seattle, San Diego, Honolulu, and the District of Columbia. Um, and so without further ado, I'm going to pass it off to Hannah to look at New York. Sure. So we're just going to go through briefly each of our case studies and give a brief overview of what we did and what we learned. So for New York, one of the reasons that we identified this as a promising comparison for um, San Jose and Santa Clara County is really that it's a high cost area. But not only is it a high cost area, but there's a lack of housing stock. A high population density in a, in a busy business district means that many people come to the area and this lack of housing has really driven up prices. And 
even among those who can who can find and afford housing, most over 55% of households are rent burdened, which means that they spend over 30% of their income on on housing. So what's really interesting about the homelessness, the homeless themselves, is that New York actually has the largest raw number of homeless in the United States at over 64,000. And this, and this number has been growing. The number of homeless has grown 73% since 2002, and even recently 11.5% since 2012. And this has been growing, this upward trend has been simultaneous with an upward growth in the housing prices. Specifically, Manhattan has grown over 17% in the last year, and over 60% of the homeless are, center, are centered in Manhattan in these business districts. And so because of this lack of housing, what's happened is that the number of homeless has been, on the has been seen on the streets. And so the shelter culture has been adapting to meet this, this growing demand. And so instead of just becoming a place to sleep, shelters have now inc incorporated an education part, a, a aid for mental and physical disabilities. And on May 5th, 2014, Mayor Bill de Blasio actually announced a new plan entitled Housing New York, um, which is a 10-year plan for the city that was that's intends to create 200,000 new affordable housing units. And 60% of these housing units will be sort of created from the preservation and restoration of existing units, whereas 40% will be new construction. What makes this plan really interesting is that it's an attempt to actually focus on permanent affordable housing as opposed to just the historic focus on the, um, on the shelter system. And the city, state, and federal funds have committed um, $41.1 billion to this over the 10 years. And so now I just wanted to delve into a little bit of the structure of this plan specifically. Um, keep in mind that this isn't a intergovernmental structure, it is more of a plan, and these are the components of the plan um, that we put together into a structure. So New York City is really the drive, and specifically the mayor's office, is the driving force of this plan. Um, but because New York, New York State has also committed funds, um, part of this plan is cr the creation of a city-state task force, which will be comprised of elected officials from both the city and the state. And this task force is really there to ensure that the policies that are being implemented are beneficial to both the city and state. Um, and so from New York City, the other the other sort of big governing structure will be the City Implementation Advisory Board. Um, Mayor de Blasio has not yet announced who will be a part of this board, but he has said that it will be members from the diverse housing community and lots of different types of stakeholders. So this advisory board will be overseeing the various task force and working groups that um, will be be created through this plan. So I just wanted to highlight a few. One of one of these is the bottlenecks working group, which is focusing on reducing the bottlenecks and delays in the process of transitioning the homeless from shelters to <laughs> permanent housing. Um, the Efficient Housing Development Task Force is one that focuses on the construction of new units and trying to end the delays in the development process. And lastly, the Financing Reforms Task Force is one that plans to convene by August 2014 and deliver a recommendation to the city by December 2014 about what they believe to be innovative financing techniques to move this plan forward. So the advisory board oversees all of these task forces and then provides guidance to the city and really a bottom-up approach. So while this plan was just announced a few weeks ago, there you can't really make any sort of judgments on what the successes have been, but I did want to point out a few interesting components. One being that this plan really identifies homelessness as a priority for the mayor. Um, second, it really also focuses on an engagement with the nonprofit sector. Um, in the plan, it points out that over 200 individuals were consulted in order to figure out what the best um, means would be, and a lot of those were the nonprofits who are really operating the shelters on a day to day basis. Um, and third, the, the primary focus on this plan, as you could see from some of those task forces and working groups, is the focus on sort of reducing inefficiencies that are caused by um, poor coordination between different um, agencies. So even though the plan is very new, there are still a lot that can be learned from it. And with that, I'll pass on to Mary for Seattle. 
So we identified Seattle and King County, Washington, as viable analogs for San Jose and the city, or, uh, and the county of Santa Clara for several different reasons. Uh, first of all, it's obviously a West Coast city with a relatively temperate climate, desirable in which to live. Um, it's real also seen as sort of a city for opportunists. Both San Jose and Seattle are sort of seen as these up-and-coming cities for um, emerging industries such as tech or biotech, but it really attracts a lot of um, up-and-coming people who are willing to pay high prices for housing. And in fact, that has been the case. Um, housing prices have increased dramatically over the last 10 years, and accordingly, uh, the number of homeless has increased with that. Um, Seattle, similarly to San Jose, is known for its large proportion of homeless individuals. Uh, a point in time estimate last year uh, indicated that the number of homeless in King County was as high as 9,000. And um, as I just mentioned, due to the increasing demand for housing from people coming into these emerging um, hubs for technology, uh, the number of increasing has been the number of homeless has been increasing over time. Um, similarly. Uh, the lack of, it's a, it's kind of a multifaceted problem in Seattle as well as San Jose. Um, the primary problem in both areas is the lack of affordable housing, but it's also driven by other factors such as drug dependency or mental illness or lack of living wage jobs. So the intergovernmental collaboration that exists in Seattle and King County is called the Committee to End Homelessness or the CEH. And um, it has three full-time staff, which is um, important to note, and it has sort of a triumvirate funding approach. Uh, it's funded primarily by the City of Seattle, uh, King County, and the United Way of King County. And together these comprise these uh, two and a half full-time staff whose jobs are dedicated to um, implementing the tasks and policies given by the board, which I'm going to describe now. Um, so the, over, uh, the overarching organizational structure of the board um, is interesting. It's it's a uh, open membership, meaning that anyone can join at any time. Um, this entity meets quarterly, but um, as I said, they have these full time staff dedicated to implementing this board's plan. Uh, so the governing board is comprised of two uh, twenty two different members um, who represent a wide variety of interests: uh, corporate, nonprofit. Uh, the mayor of Seattle serves on it. Uh, it's co chaired by two corporate executives in King County, and it also has representatives from. Um, uh, Seattle, Kirkland, Bellevue, and uh, Kirkland. So it really has pretty much all interests represented on this board. Um, this interagency inter -agency council, shown here, um, is comprised strictly of corporate, uh, <coughs> corporate representatives. And this is really interesting because these are all business executives um, who can provide, um, can pro or, um, who are tasked with uh, proposing and uh, budgeting an annual uh, expenditure plan for uh, the CEH each year. And this is uh, really interesting because their success and expertise in business really makes them sort of good uh, advocates of this issue. Uh, the third component of this, as you'll see here, the Consumer Advisory Council is also a really fascinating structure in uh, this collaboration because it is made up of people who either are or have previously been homeless. So um, this kind of, I mean, this obviously provides for a lot of um, evidence-based uh, insight from people who actually know how the system works and it really serves to balance out this representation by uh, public officials, nonprofit officials, um, and corporate representatives. So it really is sort of a multifaceted approach. Um, as I said, the full-time staff here are, um, who, are, are funded by, who are funded by the uh, three entities I mentioned, King County, Seattle, and the United Way, um, are working full-time to implement the plans who, uh, that are decided by the CEH at their quarterly meetings. Uh, in addition to these full-time staff, there are also um, initiative staff who are funded, whose salaries are funded by philanthropic grants. And um, this really speaks to sort of the subgroups within the homeless populations because you can't just have a blanket approach to um, addressing homelessness. You have to have people who are in charge of um, families initiatives or people who are in charge of young adults initiatives and as you can see there are um, specific, uh, there's specific differentiation when dealing with these two major groups. So, um, so far the CEH has seemed to be a really, uh, a really progressive note of intergovernmental collaboration. 
Um, the Consumer Advisory Council has offered really unique insight from people who are acutely aware of how the system works or how it doesn't. Um, and, and it's really um, sort of a practical approach and it, when uh, compared to a system that might only uh, be comprised of business executives and, pro and uh, public officials. Um, furthermore, the partners of CEH, uh, since its inception, have created over 5,000 new units of affordable housing. And uh, this is important because, as we said, uh, the lack of affordable housing in Seattle is the primary cause of homelessness. And uh, in 2011, uh, an important statistic noted that over 4,000 people were able to leave homelessness. So that really speaks to this uh, movement toward a permanent solution to homelessness. So now I'm going to pass it off to Hunter. He's going to talk about San Diego. <clears throat> so uh, there are a few trends emerging in terms of the, the cities that we, that we chose. Um, part of that was um, intentional because in our, in our inter, uh, intermediate meeting with the clients, uh, they really wanted us to focus on expensive areas because that's what they felt contributed a lot to San Jose's problem. Um, so some of the defining characteristics in San Diego are, are similar. Um, it's very high cost, um, and one person in the Housing Commission mentioned that there's a, a gentrification happening right now, much like there is um, in San Francisco. Um, in, traditionally, a lot of the most affordable housing has been in the warehouse district in downtown San Diego. Uh, and in recent years, in the past decade, there's been a lot of redevelopment. So a lot of that, um, that housing has been uh, torn down and replaced with a new stadium for the baseball team, uh, public parks that close after, after dark, uh, and new high-rises with high-end high, uh, high -end luxury condominiums, uh, hotels, restaurants. Um, so a lot of that has, that has displaced a lot of the homeless population. It's also warm weather, um, and in terms of population, uh, the county, not the city, um, is the fifth largest county in the United States. Um, the homelessness, as of the January 2014 point in time count, was just under uh, 9,000. Uh, and the majority of that is in the city of San Diego proper. Um, additionally, there's a large naval presence, presence in uh, San Diego County, um, with multiple bases around the area. Uh, and so one, one person I spoke with noted that a lot, a lot of times the uh, veterans, when they're discharged, fall into the homeless population because they don't make the money that's necessary to afford the rents uh, in San Diego. Uh, in addition, uh, I mean, they've been identified for uh, fe special federal funding for veterans specifically, homeless veterans, uh, but oftentimes the vouchers that, that, um, the, 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 that money comes in the form of special vouchers that have very strict requirements in terms of how long they've served, when they served, um, they must be honorable to be discharged, they must have more issues than just homelessness in order to qualify. So they've had trouble matching those vouchers to people who need them. Uh, so traditionally, they've always had a, a council, um, and it's an intergovernmental council. It's called the Regional Continuum of Care Council. Um, it's been around for 20 years, uh, but it's always been a, a kind of informal uh, agreement between all the entities. Uh, as you can see here, there is no direct line between the city of San Jose or the county of San Diego. Uh, within the county, housing, community development, and within the city, the housing commission, uh, provide most of the services for homeless. Um, and they sit on the board uh, for the Regional Continuum of Care Council, um, as well as you know, being some of the people who are implementing these initiatives. Uh, but there is no official, formal power, uh, authority, uh, or the ability to direct funds um, by the Continuum of Care Council. Uh, so as you can see, the lower image uh, illustrates that with the, the two-way arrows. Um, it is very much a collaboration, um, less than a, a, a official governmental entity. Um, so they sit on the board, they can contribute to the conversation and, and direct uh, the initiatives and then also agree on the other side to follow through with that. Uh, what's very interesting about San Diego is that actually in the last month uh, they're under, they've begun the process of a restructuring. Um, so this is if you were to dive into that middle box, the Regional Continuum of Care Council, um, and this is what their new organizational structure looks like. Um, there's a new governance board that is uh, uh, cross-sector um, in terms of private sector, public sector, uh, nonprofits, and all levels of government. Um, and they're very specifically designated seats in terms of, you know, this person must come from the office of uh, the Housing Commission, uh, this person must be someone in law enforcement, and so on. Um, 
they are advised by intergovernmental council that has no formal power within the, the, the continuum of care council. Um, and the idea is that that will include members of government from all levels. So, for instance, it can be um, a staff member from a U.S. senator's office representing California, or a state, uh, state assembly person, uh, someone from the city council or the board of supervisors. Uh, and they're going to have all those people on this advisory council. Um, beneath them, they're going to have five committees, um, again, uh, a mix of people who are on the governance board, uh, as well as just people who are invested in the cause, um, lower level people uh, who are doing more of the groundwork for the nonprofits in the area, uh, things like this. And then below that, what they're developing now is uh, the infrastructure organization, which is going to actually be the people who are managing the day-to-day -day work of the council, who are going to have an actual organizational budget for the first time ever. Um, so, a few notes about the RCCC. As I mentioned, it's in its, its newest form is still in the early stages. They actually just, uh, earlier this year, in January or February, hired their first full-time employee. Um, and I spoke with her, actually. Um, it was a great conversation. Uh, and she's working on a, a, a interim one-year grant uh, that's awarded to the Housing Commission. So she's being, being paid through the Housing Commission, uh, really with the, the sole job of uh, fleshing out what this is going to look like. So they've very explicitly uh, uh, highlighted how the governance board's going to work, but those five advisory uh, committees as well as the organizational structure don't have an explicit uh, structure yet. Um, so it was a $197,000 grant, uh, which is paying her as a full-time staff member as well as one of their part-time staff member uh, who's been historically leading this for free and has really uh, been the point person on restructuring. Uh, another $130,000 grant is in the works to expand her team uh, to include at least one more full-time person uh, and two more part-time uh, positions for the next year as they, they finalize what it's going to look like for the future. Uh, another important point uh, that she brought up was that there's a new focus to, uh, with this new structure, focus on data uh, measurement and uh, improvement over time. So one very quick example is they've, they've gone through this one program uh, they deemed matching, uh, matching voucher program, wherein they match a homeless service voucher with a Section 8 housing voucher uh, because the funding comes from two different sources and are for two different uh, things. So they can match funding for putting someone in housing uh, with a voucher uh, or funding for uh, case management, for mental health issues, um, for addictions. Um, and so that's what they've done. Uh, they've gone through three iterations and they've learned from their mistakes each time. Uh, and the idea is that they're going to do more of this uh, process improvement and now they have the more formal structure, they can manage and keep track of where their successes are and where they've failed. Um, and finally, one note is that Sort of what spurred the, the call to restructure is that uh, on the side there's been a, a private sector intervention essentially where uh, a lot of the private sector, the business leaders, uh, have gotten together with a lot of the nonprofit funders and funding groups and they've actually created to an extent uh, a secondary council uh, where they're doing a lot of the same work and a lot of the people sit on actually both, uh, but they're doing... Um, work mostly in terms of philanthropic grants and contributions uh, to address the homelessness problem as well as this continuum of care council. Uh, so that's why they're trying to expand the power of the continuum of care uh, so that it can be a government-led initiative. Uh, with that, I'm going to pass it on to you, Tubbs, Daniel, uh, for Honolulu. Okay, so San Jose want us to look at Honolulu specifically because of a warm climate and how high, uh, um, high housing costs. Uh, specifically with the how uh, the high housing costs, the average median price is six hundred thirty thousand dollars, and it has the lowest uh, lowest home ownership in the country. Uh, but the warm climate, it's able to homeless individuals are able to stay there the whole year round, and the temperate and even in the winter conditions are very similar to the summer. Um, it's also the Demo there's a democratic mayor and a democratic governor as well um, within within the city, so it's a very liberal um, political situation. In terms of the homeless, uh, the homeless individuals themselves, it's a very large homeless population, um, 4,500 individuals on the island of Oahu, and in terms of jurisdiction, Honolulu County is the island of Oahu, Honolulu is the city, um, and that's 0.5% of the population, um, and it's been steadily increasing over the past four years. Uh, since 2010, it's been 20, there's been a 25% increase, which is pretty alarming. Specifically, the mayor and the governor have focused on chronic homelessness as a subgroup they want to work on. The people who have been in and out 
for years of homelessness and the people who have mental and health um, issues. So the major player, the major interagency inter organization that we're dealing, that's dealing with this issue is called the Hawaii Interagency Council on Homelessness. Now this is a state-run initiative. And what I mean state-run, it's different from all my other uh, friends here because this, uh, theirs was on the local level. Now, most of the resources of Hawaii in terms of this state-run initiative are still focusing on the island of Oahu, the major, uh, which is the most populous island in the, uh, in the state. This is a gov the governor of uh, the governor of Hawaii, Neil Abercrombie. Near, near Neil Abercrombie, formally appointed the coordinator on homelessness, which is a paid position. It's a, his name is Colin Kibben, and he has a full-time assistant named Brian Madison. And within this committee, um, he has brought in all different members of all the different faces of homelessness, whether it be health, housing, um, emergency services, and unemploy unemployment. All these, all these parts that are very important to the issue meet quarterly, and they discuss what problems they can go over together. Um, so we have state department directors. We have the Hawaii Housing Public Authority. We have the county housing public authority. We have federal agency representatives. We have HUD representatives from um, D.C. that work specifically in Hawaii. They're working on this committee. And we have community leaders, whether it be in the nonprofit area, um, through faith organizations, the people who are on the ground, or we have the, we have the mayors and the, ca uh, the county directors of every island. Now, six in the, the six members, six members of each uh, are divided into four different teams, um, in respective of their specialization. Uh, one is the committee on housing, which is dealing with pretty much putting forth a more affordable housing for these individuals who don't have a, who don't have a home. And secondly, we have the committee on health, um, dealing with issues health issues, or the, a committee on economic stability, which is dealing with more of the unemployment. Um, and then finally, the committee on retooling the response system, which, which is more along the lines of emergency services, police officers, uh, hospitals who take in uh, individuals um, in, in the immediate, uh, in the immediate um, time. So the first three committees are more long-term goals, while the first one is more working on how we can deal with this right now. Uh, the four committees will work together, devise their own objectives and strategies individually, and come together. And Colin, the coordinator on homelessness, will try to coordinate all these approaches into a, a, um, a strategy. Now, Colin, when, he, when I talked to him on the phone, he doesn't, he was very, uh, he impressed upon me very much that he doesn't have a budget. The only budget that he has is the, the budget that each state department or federal agency or city or county comes with them to this meeting. So what his role is more of is a connector. And in the Hawaii newspaper actually called him the czar of homelessness. It's his job, day in and day out, to think about this. And while each of these representatives may think about their own issue, housing, health, or unemployment, it's his job to coordinate all these approaches, connect the right people who need to be connected. And Brian Matson's full-time assistant, is not paid through the state, just a side note, he's paid through a nonprofit organization, but he's very instrumental. So, the council's future plans, now it's relatively new. This was established in 2012. Uh, it's called the Hale Omalama Plan. I think that's right in Hawaii, I don't know. And the first part is the housing first for chronically homeless. So, rapid rehousing is the idea that the most important part of making sure homeless people get off the street is not the health aspect, it's not the unemployment, it's literally giving them a home. It's a stable situation. Uh, before, homeless individuals would go from emergency, help, emergency shelters with very strict rules and regulations to transitionals, transitional housing, and they found that they were really disincentivizing people from actually entering into the system and participating in the services. So the idea is give these homeless individuals a permanent home and then wrap those services around that home. You can do whatever you want in the home. You can drink, you can bring your dog, but the key is that we have you in the system now and that we can, we can work forward from there. Now, the key to this is actually prioritizing those who are most at risk um, and who need permanent housing the most. Not the people who just need to find one job application and go from there. It's the people who have mental and health problems. And they've realized that the best way to do this is find an overall survey of these people. And the, what they've found is the survey is called VISPADAT. And I don't want to mess this up. It's called Vulnerability Index Service Prioritization Decision Assistance Tool. That's a lot, but that's what it is. And 
what it is, it's a uniform intake and assessment, assessment system based on all the different aspects of homelessness. Before people were going in, the health organizations were just getting an understanding of their health. The housing were just getting an understanding of their home. But now when you look across all boundaries, you can finally see who is the most risk, who has the most risk, and who do we need to address first. So if you're able to prioritize. Now it's very new. They just talked to the, they just had their first report to the state legislature in, I think it was February. So Colin, in his report, he said, uh, the coordinator, he's more hopeful what will happen. He's happy that we're able to address these situations coordinate with a coordinated response, and it's a very good step for Hawaii. Um, and with that, I give it to Chris. All right, thanks. Um, so I'm going to take us through our final case study, and that's the District of Columbia. Um, so just very briefly, an overview of some of the important characteristics. Like all of the regions you've seen so far, it's a high-cost area. Um, one important thing to point out is it is jurisdictionally complex, and that's not simply because of the sheer number of jurisdictions surrounding it uh, between the municipalities and counties and states, but it's also because of its sort of unique status as a city that administers uh, federal programs like Medicaid. Um, so that's an important point to note in terms of the distribution of funds. Uh, it's a cold weather location that stands in contrast to San Jose. It's also a liberal political climate. Um, and homelessness in the district is actually extremely prevalent. It's almost 7,000 individuals, which is striking considering that the district has 630,000 people. Over 1% of the population is homeless. Um, this has also increased over time, and importantly, it hasn't increased uniformly across the population. Uh, although homeless, homelessness among individuals has decreased by around 3% over the past four years, it's actually increased by almost 40%. Uh, among families uh, during that same period. So this suggests uh, that the district has maybe done well with one population, but not so well with the other. So this is the structure. I apologize that the, you can't see the bottom of the graphic, but this is the structure uh, that they formed to address homeless, homelessness. Uh, it was formed in 2005, and it is the Interagency Council on Homelessness. Uh, it is a uh, a, um, an organization entirely within the district. It is part of the, essentially a part of the district government. Uh, the mayor sits at the top. Um, he monitors the activities and um, he sort of provides some counsel on how to spend the budget, but really who at the, who's at the heart of this is the chair, and that is the, uh, this, the city administrator who is appointed uh, by the mayor, um, and this body is added on to his responsibilities. Um, uh, in addition to the city administrator, there are also 14 agency directors uh, and district officials um, who are paid for their day jobs, which are th those uh, titles, but are also as part of their jobs assigned to work with this committee. Additionally, there are some community representatives, both formerly homeless individuals and also um, representatives from the nonprofit uh, that runs the continuum of care, and that's the community partnership. Um, and so essentially, they don't, they're not funded. They don't have full-time staff. They receive staff assistance. How, and they, additionally, they only meet quarterly. What's important to note, though, is that they have uh, planning and budgeting control in that all of the agencies that are working around this issue, as well as the, uh, the community partnership, um, all uh, are budgeted and planned by this committee. So you, everything from the Department of Human Services uh, to the Department of uh, Employment Services uh, receives their uh, goals from this committee. So just a couple of lessons that we've learned from this. Uh, some good things from this committee that have uh, come out or come to be are the fact that this better coordination has allowed for a more um, coherent strategy in terms of addressing homelessness. So Dan pointed this out uh, in Hawaii, but it's the idea that if you pair housing solutions with um, treatment solutions, you get better outcomes in the long term. It also allows resources to be used more efficiently. However, there are some important limitations, and I think the most, the most uh, striking one is that, uh, it's a pretty obvious one, but funding is crucial. Um, without funding, uh, this, uh, the ICH can't really do anything because they only budget for the services. They don't actually have the money. Uh, furthermore, this is a local solution, not a regional one, because it only encompasses the district proper. Um, it, 
doesn't, it only affects homelessness within the boundaries of the district, and homelessness is a very fluid issue. So there's actually been a lot of antagonism uh, with uh, neighboring counties, particularly in Maryland, um, and that's really uh, inhibited better cooperation on this issue towards creating a regional solution. So now I'm going to hand it over to Mary. So I guess we're just going to talk about some of the uh, final observations that we have um, come up with throughout the last past, uh, the last eight weeks of research. Uh, one important disclaimer that we need to um, emphasize is that these case studies that we performed were not done in a controlled laboratory setting. So therefore, we cannot and did not attempt to make any definitive causal statements. Um, we're not going to tell our clients, the San Jose, it was County of Santa Clara and San Jose that if you do X, then you will get Y, because that's just impossible. You can't, there is no blanket strategy to properly address homelessness, because each specific region has uh, distinguishing characteristics that render some, um, some approaches effective and others not. So the first thing we want to talk about, as, both of, as many of us have uh, alluded to, is that the homelessness is not a blanket population. Um, there are many subgroups that comprise the homeless, and uh, that varies for in each region. As you would imagine, uh, you can't have one strategy that, um, is ad that uh, addresses homelessness for the entire homeless population because there are um, different causes for homelessness. Uh, you can't have a, the same strategy to address homelessness for veterans or runaways or families who have lost their housing due to increase in prices or people with substance abuse or people with mental illness. Um, you just need to find a different strategy for each, and uh, as many people have referenced, coordination and um, differentiation between these agencies is important to do that. The second uh, observation we've come to is that government can't do it alone. Uh, you need participation and collaboration with non-governmental entities. Um, collaboration with nonprofits is critical because they're the ones who oftentimes are actually running the shelters and are out in the field conducting outreach and um, trying to address this problem even if they're not budgeted. Uh, private sector participation is also critical and that's for a couple of different reasons. Um, first of all, uh, private sector insight uh, allows for business oriented insight and often these individuals uh, can provide uh, plans and strategies that are economically efficient and um, financially sound. Uh, we've seen this to be the case in Seattle where um, where uh, the funders group is comprised of corporate executives. And uh, this evidently has been successful because in 2011, the funders group of the CEH was recognized by the Harvard Kennedy School as one of the top 25 innovations in government. Um, a second reason why, public, or by, why uh, private sector participation is critical is because it sends a signal to the community. Um, it really does away with this notion um, that it, addressing homelessness may just be a a uh, faceless government bill, or just an um, item on a governmental ad uh, agenda that won't actually be addressed. Um, by supporting uh, its efforts to end homelessness, the private sector indicates that it's a community approach to a community problem. So next, I'm going to pass on to Hannah to talk about the other ones. So as Mary alluded to, in order to get this private sector participation, there needs to be a political champion. And a pol by a political champion, I mean there has to be an elected official at a high level who has made this <coughs> excuse me, one of their policy objectives. And as we've seen sort of across our case studies, um, more often than not, we've all had a political champion, and a lot of times it has been the mayor. And so one of the things that we are going to stress to San, to San Jose and, this, and Santa Clara County is that their mayor needs to be involved in whatever agency they put forward. And it's actually great timing because on June 3rd, there's a primary for the mayoral election, and there's already been talk among candidates that homelessness is an issue. And so what needs to happen is that San Jose, San Jose needs to ensure that once whoever the mayor is gets into office, that they have they established this and they put some political capital behind it. Um, because on its own, homelessness is not a winning issue. Um, there, there needs to be a political figure to garner that support and, gar and sort of create a community engagement around it. However, a political champion is just not enough. In addition to having the figurehead, there needs to be a structure that they put into place to carry out the operations. Because when 
a, an elected official goes out of office, there needs to be something to continue on the work, as we've seen in our cities sometimes when the political champion has left office, all their work sort of remains um, unfinished. And um, in this structure specifically, there needs to be a czar. There needs to be someone, as was in the case of Honolulu, who wakes up every morning thinking about homelessness, who is paid specifically to deal with these issues, and who first and and who has this special skill set, special skill set to connect and to go across across all agencies that are involved in homelessness. As we've seen, as as we hope that you have seen throughout our presentation, is that homelessness is not an issue that is solved by one agency. It's something that involves all levels of government and even within cities themselves, different agencies such as health, such as housing, um, such as, as emergency services. And there needs to be one czar, one person who can not only just work with their immediate superiors and those reporting to them, but who can connect between all. And lastly, it takes money which might seem like an obvious statement, um, but not only does it take money to create policy changes, but it also there also needs to be funding that specifically goes to support the czar, that specifically goes to this intergovernmental structure for two reasons. One, because it those are the people that know where the funding should go and know how to deploy it best. And two, because those who are in charge, such as the czar and the czar's subordinates, need to also have a responsibility, their funding, their salary needs to come from funding so that they feel a responsibility to this issue. So with that, I'll... Uh, so, <clears throat> we mentioned San Jose and Santa Clara at the very beginning of our presentation. Uh, we haven't talked about them much. Uh, furthermore, as, as Mary mentioned and kind of uh, uh, hinted at, is this idea that there is no template solution. Uh, there's no silver bullet. Uh, in all of our cases, there, there's no single example that they can mimic exactly and see success. Uh, so that might be alarming, because uh, we have to make recommendations to San Jose and Santa Clara next week. Uh, but what we truly believe is that <coughs> Santa Clara and San Jose are in a place where they can be the leaders uh, in making these changes and creating the best uh, intergovernmental collaboration among all the cities we've studied. Uh, we've outlined uh, the most important observations, the best practices that we've gleaned from all of our case studies, and we believe that if they take those best practices and apply them within our county or within their county, uh, they will be the ones to, uh, to have the most success addressing homelessness around Santa Clara County. Uh, so with that, I want to thank you and open up to any questions.